All right, so um, I would like to talk about Porsches today. I really would. But in the critique queue folder, there are a lot of environments built up, which might help me illustrate to you guys the importance of the rules of depth. Um, the rules of depth are as follows. Let's talk about them and then apply them quickly um, with like this uh, assembly line formation, all these environments that we have here today. Okay, so the rules of depth are many. <laughs> There's the rule of depth that is probably the most important, which is, let's just say first we have one sphere beside, or let's say a triangle beside another triangle, and they're both on the same horizon line with both the same contrast, same everything. They're exactly the same tr triangle beside the other triangle. Right now, depth is zero. Zero depth. Zero percent depth. <clears throat> Let's copy this and paste it and apply just one rule of depth. Just one the next rule. There's really no order to them. It's many of them and um, we're applying them now. This rule of depth is really simple. Ah, oh, shit, they're not the same triangle. Let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Let me just um, make sure they're the same size triangle because that'll significantly change the class's effectiveness if they're not the same size triangle. All right. Okay, so again, zero depth here. Let's apply a little bit of depth with one layer in front, one object in front of the other, so that they layer. All right now we've applied stacking, meaning this overlap. Okay, but they're still both on the same horizon line. This is still not maximized depth. Let us then do more. Let us change their size as well as stack them. Okay. And after this, the paintovers I do for these environments will be very easy to follow. So we're going to change the size, but we're still going to keep it on the same horizon line. Okay, so scale, that is what we just did. Now, let us change their size, overlap them, and raise it along a new horizon line. So scale, as well as the depth of the horizon. So, the, so we're gonna shrink, actually I won't shrink it anymore. I'm just gonna raise it along a new horizon line. So the horizon line in this case is going to be a horizon line that is not the grid but the main horizon line. So this is this could be the main horizon line right here. But this triangle and this triangle are on their own horizon longitude line upon the earth. So like one triangle is here, one triangle is here, but this is the real horizon line that a viewer would see. All right? Everybody following? Who's following? Say aye. <clears throat> okay, so these are all the main structural changes that you could do to your objects in your environment to create more depth because most of the reason why an environment sucks, an environment drawing sucks, is because it has no depth. Um, and that's because the depth is like non-existent. So that's why, it, that's why, I wouldn't say the depth is bad, I say that there's no depth. Do you understand? So there's other things that you can do that are in that are atmospheric changes that are vision related reasons why an environment has no depth or things that you can do to these to these right to get to create more depth. So I would say that they are beside this last column. Once we have applied all the structural changes of depth, so horizon, stacking and scale, we are left with these 
uh, atmospheric changes. So that means that we are going to apply an atmospheric perspective to the far triangle. All right, look at that. For line art, that passes as depth because right, it's far away. There's a lot of reasons why the distant object is hazier than the nearby object. Nearby object is closer, there's less atmosphere between us and the object, therefore less humidity between us, less light, um, less uh, air molecules with light bouncing around. Okay. Then there's the fact that we have more contrast, so that's basically the contrast, and then we have um, the detail. Right, so this could have a higher cluster or a more concentrated cluster of detail, and this one has like barely an indication of the surface texture. So this is a representation of what the human eye can see, also the obstruction of the atmosphere. So obstruction of atmosphere causes us to not catch all the all the detail cluster, but then an eagle comes up and can see a, a, a fucking mouse in between a bunch of shrubs. The mouse already has camouflage built into its genetics, but an eagle can see it and come snap it off, out of the ground at like a mile high in the air. Um, or something. I don't know what the flight is for. That's not a mile. It's like a couple hundred feet. I don't know. Um, and then there's uh, uh, the fact that this oops, far triangle, not only does it have less detail cluster and atmospheric fade, but it is blurred. Not that blurred. Okay. <clears throat> so this can be a represent is a representation of the weakness of the human eye. That's why I don't say they're structural. I say that uh, physics really. It's just that we have a full room, a full open room. That's why I would say I call it structural just for lack of a better term. The triangle is here on this horizon line. And this triangle is the same size on this horizon line. Anything that happens here with this camera is structural. Anything that happens here is atmospheric or related to, the, to your weakness of vision. So the fact that the human eye can't see everything all the time is uh, the reason why this is blurred as well as this. So vision, um, okay, so let me see, let me make sure that I caught everything. Do you guys have any questions so far? All right, any questions at all? Okay, all right, so if you guys recall back to the three ways to detail, there are three ways to detail. Um, you are dropping these three ways to detail when you apply these changes. So when you have the blur, the very most important way to detail is with edges. When you have the contrast drop and atmospheric fade, that means that we have contrast dropped off as the way to detail, which is the second most important way to detail an object. Meaning that this is all the stuff you do to the eyes in a portrait. This is how you create a focal point. The focal point rings through all of these. And then the last way to detail, which is the detail cluster loss, is actually just shrinking your brush, so small brush. Okay. So, let me see if I can get the uh, <clears throat> chat up. So, um, so this is the stuff that makes an object look like it's far away, right? And that's it. There's, I'm sure there's all alternatives and subcategories and this and that and, and, and uh, the, the curvature of an object and the distance and three-point perspective. It's not as important as all that because we've pulled off a lot of 
dimension just off this little 2D diagram. Um, so when you make things backlit, you mean like a silhouette, like a, like a sunset scene? You only have cut out, th um, like silhouette cut out of the uh, like little thumbnails of the, of the object. When things are backlit, it means that the light is in the back of the uh, environment, which means anything that it, we, are, we are opposing the light, meaning we are looking at the shadow side of anything. So everything is just dark. However, atmospheric perspective may still play in this because um, there might still be a lot of humidity and that humidity is catching light um, and this distorting or making lighter the clip art of a tree and this is, you know, the sunset far away, a little bit more bright than the one in the foreground. <clears throat> um, does atmospheric perspective transition from one point perspective? It has nothing to do with perspective. We just call it atmospheric perspective because if we were on this pyramid looking at this one, this one would be the fady one. So that means that the faded one, so that means this is a perspective, uh, is a question of perspective. A question of where you're standing. That's all that it means when I say atmospheric perspective. So let's go through all of these and see where they failed. All right? So does everyone have their notes handy? All right, so let's see where all these artists failed. So we've got mountains that are supposed to be far away, not separated by any kind of edge or contrast separation here. So I'm going to edit as I go. So the objects in the background need to be significantly, if they are these big mountains, and they're not even mountain shaped, they're just, they seem like bones of a big colossal animal that died a long time ago. That's the only way I can read geology and um, like the, 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 not the geology, the, the, the environment doesn't develop this way. Things develop toward gravity. Things are always corroding downward, meaning they have an, a slope upward. That's just how, how, and this is not corroding downward. This, is, this looks like it's a person. It's not something that has corroded over eons. Um, that's why I say look up some references for what mountains do as a texture. All right, so I'm going to grab this environmental colors. The way to appropriately do atmospheric fade, atmospheric perspective, is to grab the environment color and fade with it. All right. And then there's the fact that they are themselves brighter for a lot of reasons. It could be, again, humidity. So there could be a lot of extra air on the bottoms, extra air in between the valleys extra air at the top with the mountains. Do you see where I'm going with this? So there's a lot of ways that we could apply more atmospheric perspective here. Unless the mountains are not in front, you know, whatever you want to do. There's the fact that the objects in the background are not blurred. It's just as sharp as objects in the foreground, the immediate foreground, which is a mistake. Um, these are the rules of depth. There's also a light environment that I'll be talking about, so don't get overwhelmed. We'll be talking about light environment, which is a big thing that this artist here has broken. It's something that's really bothered me for a while, this painting, um, just because there's like no rhyme or reason behind any of the stuff they've done. Um, half the sky is bright, but the light is coming from the side of the mountain, so the sunset isn't this way, but how the upper above the clouds is, is blue for some reason. It's not acceptable. And then there's no unification between the light source color and the rest of the painting. There's no combination of those, but let's just focus on the rules of depth for now. Then there's scale. You haven't really shrunk in these, so they don't really look like they're in the distance. And I'm going to try to give them that natural shape to mountains. You know, they look really boring and they're just right beside each other and there's not much stacking, which I'll talk about in a second. This little guy here. Okay, so all the mountains are right beside each other, and um, that's not acceptable. They shouldn't be right beside each other. I'm 
sure that nature was a little bit more random than that. If they are beside each other, then they're li you're grooming for where the, the cameraman starts. You guys paint for the camera guy. You shouldn't do that. Camera guy, nature existed before the camera guy came around. So randomize. Okay. And then this whole house thing is actually the focal point here. And it is almost contested by the contrast of the, especially early morning, you got early morning dew, you got early morning stuff, contested by the contrast of this mountain over here in the distance. And this time I'm gonna use the white of the morning to do that. And I'm also going to use a little bit of atmospheric blue to um, just at least change the values and some of this stuff. Oh, wrong layer. I'm just giving a blue wherever there's a shadow. I'm going to also desaturate the top of the mountain because it seems more rocky than green. But I'm going to green the base of the mountain because it seems like more grass would grow out there. And I will create more of a plain separation. It seems like this is a great valley in between this mountain range and this mountain range, meaning that there's more air movement and cloud movement and just general changes in the like air pressure. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But that's what I'm saying is that they that it's not the same plane so the air should also be representing that. There's more fog formations, there's a body of water maybe. Okay. All right. And then there's the this section of the which I have to relasso. Did I lose my lasso? Um Select, move selection. So I don't want to lose my lasso, so I'll just redo the thing after that little valley light because I don't want to lose my lasso. Here I'm going to choose a new, because you're just using dark red, so I'm just going to continue that blue. But I'm going to use a blue version of that red, which just means that I go back up in the slider and slide down and just cool down the values that are shadowed. And use those with color mode to darken and cool down the shadows of all those reds because in a second, and I'm just exaggerating it here because in a second I'm gonna bring in the universal light environment change, which is the end all and be all of the, of the, the environments. You know, apart from depth, the most important thing about an environment is the fact that you, uh, you unify it with one light source. So, Two things I can do is choose the levels option and darken the foreground, or I can use a slider because we're creating a depth change. Objects in the foreground are closer to the camera, so there's more darkness. Okay, and I'm just following this cloudy day that you've that you've kind of showed us here with the blue skies and stuff. Um, and then the one in the foreground immediately should be a little bit more silhouetted. And the grass directly outside of that, I won't need lasso for that, should be um, brighter, shouldn't be that dark. Just create your shadows this way. And then if the shadow is traveling this way, that means so we've got a shadow traveling this way, that means this shadow travels this way. That means this shadow travels this way, and we've got longer sunrise or sunset shadows. And then just like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to get this universal color and then just slap it everywhere. Okay, so we're going to use it on, I'm just using the exam, just using that, that's all I'm doing. I'm just grabbing the color and putting it on. That's it. All 
right? Just like that. And that should do a great deal for helping unify the, the values together by using that light environment color. Okay, so this is a really, really technical demonstration of the benefit of depth for your, for your environments. Really super technical. There's not really a lot of fancy changes I'm making apart from environment uh, depth. Okay. Um, one thing you can do is just... Uh, darken the tops of the mountains just to show how they've breached the, the, the haze or the shadows beneath. And then another big thing about environments is that you need to um, unify the sky color. That's a big one. Because you can't just have these massive gradients running across the sky uh, that make no sense. We don't, we're not big enough to see these sky gradients really all that much, and especially in the daytime. Because we're so small, we don't catch these gradients. Only sunset do we catch these really big gradients because the sun is so low and it's on one half of the sky which we can wrap our heads around and look at. When the sun is high, we don't really um, catch all these gradients. So doing something as simple as this will look better for your drawing than these crazy gradients running across your painting. All right, but you know you, you don't want to put white in the background unless it's overcast or something deliberate like that. Um, but just just choosing a, a base sky color should help your illustration along. If it is sunrise, we do have a gradient. Um, sunset, sunrise, there are gradients in the sky, so that's permissible here, but we still need like a general brightness, because the sun is now above the horizon, so we need something that makes sense. And then I'm going to use this blue sky color to normalize the reds, because they're way too red and unusual, and that's another thing that light does if done right. When you choose your palette, you have to run it through the environment wash. All right, meaning that you're washing all the colors. We may have red, we may think we have red, but we don't actually have full red. We have red that has um, passed through the sky color as like, a, I would say, as the environment wash. And you can contrast up as much as you want, just as long as your values don't disrupt the wash of the environment, which is that blue. So before, See how close up they felt, and after they feel a little bit more in the distance. And that's just depth. That's all we did today, and a little bit of light environment. Okay. <clears throat> and that's and I'm and I'm still bothered about that sky color because you can just do so much more than than that. You can really brighten it up. You can push it. A lot further when the sky sunrise rises the you know the half, far half of the sky still gets some light these clouds can still be white it's just that you have a very dim uh, sky right now which makes it this dark color right here which makes it feel like we're working with an overcast um, like stormy day which means you have to dim all the colors down if it's a stormy day and it's about to rain okay for this piece, this is not depth, this is just environment and light environment, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this piece is successful because they have, let's talk about it, what do you guys see, how have they, uh, call it out, what are the rules of depth that I showed you that are used here? Okay. The colors in the foreground appear too warm, yeah like afternoon colors and the morning colors of the background, yeah. Scale, excellent. So the size has shrunken. We've at, we're actually watching a frame by frame shrinking of the same type of rock, ideally it's the same rock. So we have created this path that fills in the background, which has created depth. Depth just means deep, it just means we've gone inside the box. Okay depth. Rock here, rock here, rock here. 
Okay. Um, what else? The color of the air unifies the entire painting. Excellent. So we've got blues in the shadows, right? We've got a very cool um, green. It's not a warm green. It's not a super warm, happy, sunshine brunch green. All right. We're talking about a very cool green. Look at that green. It's very cool in comparison to this green right here. Contrast, good. Yeah, so more black in the foreground, more dark in the foreground, and then the background is brighter. Environmental distance, there is some air in front of the mountains, different levels of detail, beautiful. So more cluster of detail in the foreground. Less detail cluster, the brushes are pretty big. Look at this, it was just one brush. Whereas, you know, the smallest brush we get is this little bit right here, see that? <clears throat> There is a vanishing point off the canvas. Yep. Okay, beautiful. <clears throat> I don't know, you guys can teach me. I, I, I can't teach you guys <laughs> anything else. You guys know everything or, like what that's happening in the painting. That's good. Um, scale on the rocks and distance shrinking. Contrast, I'm just going to go smaller. Okay, so there's some stuff that the painting did wrong, but because this is a floating sky castle place and we're surrounded by blue everywhere I don't have a problem with it so this is a very very nice painting um, it's just that there's always gonna be you know are we in the clouds are we above the cloud level so I would just say give us a hint give us something to organize our perspective so that we're at least above the cloud level do you know what I'm saying oh this is a nightmare oh god oh oh the humanity look at my last <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay, so. Uh, ah. Alright, let me just do it for the sake of the demonstration. And then, um, cut right down the middle. I'm just brightening the top half, and that should kind of help us create, like, a horizon line. Not an actual horizon line. It's the horizon line of the clouds, and then you can use this as this new bright point as to show where these clouds kind of crumple up in the distance. You know, that we're actually on a sea of clouds. So in essence, we still have a functional environment. But it wasn't necessary if we're inside this, like, canopy of clouds. All right, and scale, we use these buildings as a way to scale things. I would say your scale is a little bit off. This, this mountain looks like it's far away, and this house is pretty small, and it's a house. Um, so this, uh, you know, it's, I just feel like you should be shrinking, e either shrinking the house or shrinking the castle. Do you know what I'm saying? Or enlarging the house or shrinking the castle. They should not be at the <laughs> This is supposed to be a massive house, okay? And this is supposed to be a massive castle. Um, but if the house and the tree are the proportionate and then the castle is just like 10 times the house... Really, it's just like 10 to 15 times the size, the upward scale of a house. Not even that. I would say like it's 10 stories and a house is two stories, right? Or, f or six stories. Do you see what I'm saying? So just um, scale it proportionally. I feel like the, the castle should be this size, you know? Because this is a really far away rock. It's not this rock this rock. Anyway, so these pieces here, um, this one, has a, a similar problem because we're talking about mid-ground contrast and we don't really have enough contrast for the mid-ground. These mid-ground trees look like background trees, but you're telling me they're not because they are on the immediate mid-ground. So either darken them or lighten the background or both. So we're, again, leading our, ourselves back to that little map of depth we created, which is really important, and every artist worth their salt should know this map of, of depth rules, all right? So learn it. That's too much of a tangent. Um... This is why I try not to do environments on critique hour because I'm always lassoing. Like 70% of the class is just me cussing and lassoing. 
I've gotten pretty good at lassoing over the years anyway. So that's why this piece feels weird because it doesn't really have any rhyme or reason to the way you're using the atmospheric color. Are we in the background or are we in the foreground? That's the kind of feeling I'm picking up. So I'm going to uniformly lighten the background by choosing a sky color that's a little bit more. I'm going to just do the bottom first and let the top stay a little bit darker and then try my best at making these trees feel a little bit more foreground and then I will select inverse and darken. I, I really don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't know every answer until I try it. It's so cool because it looks like it's nighttime now, right? Yeah, that's awesome. I can darken and saturate. I would want to do that because that's the last way to detail is to boost, boost saturation. And then select the inverse and then just do like these, I don't know if I want to, um, do like these uh, bits of light that come through the background, just little bows of, of light that shine through the trees that help boost this contrast between mid-ground and foreground. But I don't know if I want to do that because Dodge Tool is evil. <clears throat> then there's the colors, the type of green you chose, I don't think matches the type of blue that's in the environment. The background reveals the temperature of the environment. Write that back to me. So that means that your greens here should not be so f happy brunch green. They should be more cold. So I'm going to change my color mode and um, just cool down these greens. That should kind of help us complete the color palette. Your greens are the biggest giveaway to whether or not you're a noob. All right, write that back. <laughs> greens reveal noobs. Because if you are not aware that there are cool greens and warm greens, you have not delved enough into color. There are cool greens and warm greens, and you used both, which is so bad, because the environment decides the temperature, not the tree. And the green in the tree, the green that comes out because of that tree, is decided by the, the temperature of the environment. It has to pass through a filter, like it has to shine through. You're also using a little bit too much sandy color. Bark is more gray than brown. Write that back to me. All right, so mid-ground object, there we go. And the only time we're going to allow this bark to be golden and sandy is where the sun hits it. Now this is where it gets a little more fun because we can uh, just decide where we want this contrast. so it can be on the sides of, of the trees but make sure it's uniform make sure it's coming and it can be just pure white you can go for pure white because the environment is cool it's cool for a reason you can go for that pure white as well and that'll still work and it's probably peeking through some of the trees remember trees cast shadows on themselves so just so just try it you already did some make sure you're following the light And then you've got bodies of water, which you guys never treat with respect because bodies of water are just a big mirror. If you know the sky color, that's the color of your body of water. Write that back to me. Okay? Unless it's murky and dirty and, you know, it, it's it's supposed to be swampy, full of dirt and bleh, then, then, uh, then that's different. But the body of water should not that white should reflect for the most part the nature of the environment is it a bright day the body of water will reflect more light easy peasy and then there's the texture difference between the body of water that is hard water I call it I guess and then there's the mist so fluid versus the gas so a hard brush versus soft brush that's this brush is not 5,000, 5,000 for an under-rendered painting, 5,000 pixels. I just spat on my screen, this is, this is frustrating. 5,000 with 
Oh my lord. So the gaseous water should work like a mist climbing upward. Should this uh, create like a difficult read for the base of the water and any detail in there. Because it's gaseous now. It's it's a it's, it's not really a mist. I mean, it's a mist is still water. It's still like fluid. It's just tiny droplets traveling in the air. It's not a gas or a steam yet, but let's just treat it like that because that's how we paint either of them in a painting. And then finally, we've got the closest object in the foreground, which is a honest to God rock, but it is not treated with any depth at all, mostly because the object in the fore in the midground here was confused. It didn't know where it was in the painting. So that's why it resulted in this not knowing where the hell it was going to go. You can darken it like this depending on the kind of canopy in the forest. You can leave it like this with a little bit of white shining on it. It really depends on how you want to frame. But the mist of the... Did I deselect? The mist of the... Uh, waterfall travels up pretty high and that should help us create a distinction here. And I want most of the saturation to be targeting the midground, so I'm not going to let too much blue sit in the background. But I am going to inverse that saturation towards the, the midground here. Being careful not to accidentally bring in those brunch greens. Okay, and then remember that the tops of the trees get lots of light. Excuse me. And that could be just, again, a pure white that you bring in. It doesn't need to be complicated. <clears throat> These shadows, if you want to be stylistic, like you can, the, the, the trees here, you can change them with a darker blue. <clears throat> More saturated blue, I could say. See what I just did to the shadow? I use the environment color on the shadows of the trees. Now I've brought in this really stylized interpretation of the midground, but I still have the contrast that maintains all the depth. Okay, and then if ever you're, you're you're lost and you don't know what you're doing, just check your grays. Your grays should be pretty clean. The trees could be a bit darker, or the background could be a bit brighter. Right. Um, there's more to the water that you could do, uh, but the crop of your environments should be mostly 1080, like, uh, what is it, 19, 19, 12, no, what is it, the ratio for movie, if you should be, you should be cinematically, um, you should be doing the cinema crop, it should be more like that. So you can either take the body of water and make it go up 1920 by 1080. I know, but the ratio, the ratio itself, uh, nine, nine, I don't know. Oh, but what is it? 16 by nine. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so let's look at the before. shrink it because then we don't even have it before. Did I do 2500? Okay. So before, after, and I would absolutely recommend more stuff in the foreground. Again, nature is randomized, so we need that. And then the I get the stuff in the foreground is where we blur for that depth as well, the, the cinema focus, the, 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 let's call it the, um, like the, the atmospheric blur, <laughs> right? Objects in the foreground are blurred because the focus, the periphery of the viewer as well as the periphery of the camera or the camera blur focal blur, whatever, is a really, really cool trick to making the foreground seem like, ooh, it's right here, right? Because right now my cup, my pen tablet, my phone, my mouse are all super blurred. 
that's that periphery blur, but in a camera I can also focus my blur. And if it's a bright day, these trees in the background, this entire background area, should should be a lot brighter. Mid tone. If it's a bright if it's a bright um if it's a bright day. So dodge total mid tones. And I'm gonna I'm gonna copy paste this layer so it's okay if the trees are getting illuminated. I'm gonna do more bright drop on one side because that's technically the sunlight. This is looking good as it is, just even with the dodge tool. On mid-tone, remember, dodge tool and highlight is dangerous. Just with this, it looks good, but if I wanted to apply that, that mist or that waterfall catching, I would choose where this light is not reaching. Actually, that's taken away most of it. So let me focus on this tree. Then some of the breaks in between them. God rays are always going to make people go go loopy. But if it's a forest and it's thickets and it's things caught in the in the, in the sunlight and it's and it's steam and it's uh, mist and yeah, this makes sense to have that. I'm not a big fan of God rays. I think they're really cheesy, but some people love them. <clears throat> it's up to you what you want to do. Okay. So before, after. I liked it before the extra god ray. I liked it like this. Maybe a half shadow moving in this way. Like just the tree itself has caught the light. This feels like more mature, less cheesy. If, I, if, I, if it was me seven years ago, I would have been like, oh uh, yes. <laughs> Ah oh, man, I would have just I would have just done it all <laughs> if this was me ten years ago. But this is a little bit more um, mature. <laughs> and then I would also not want the entire tree. I want I want to want the core shadow to be eliminated of the tree. I want the tree to have a little bit more structure to it. But I could be here for a while. I love environments because they are a big part of my root training. And then there's the steam that, as it goes up, catches the light. See, I'm having too much fun now. And that steam um, needs to be erased with a texture brush. So your eraser creates texture for you. As it catches the light. my brush as I let that steam kind of travel upward and then it catches the light a little bit as it bubbles up filter and then I blur it just because it's I didn't have a better brush than this over textured one and if this is the focal point you might want a god ray falling on it but remember, God rays falling right on the goal is kind of cheesy. And in, recently in movie making, they kind of offset it a little bit, you know? That makes it even more uh, mature, finesse. That little offset here and there. Okay, so again, don't be cheesy with your light. <clears throat> but this is a deep jungle, it's carrying a lot of light, there's particles in the air catching the light, and now we have this foreground stuff which looks great, blurred, um, background still looking a little bit too close to the contrast in the foreground, but a mid-ground, proper mid-ground, and you can put the focal point on the mid-ground. What's wrong with cheesy? It's just too much, and we've had a little bit too much Cheeto cheese nowadays in the last four years, so cheesy is bad. All right, for this piece, um, for this piece, it's a very, very murky, dark, overcast, London, 1800, periodical, I don't even, I don't even. So the best thing you can do for a, per a piece like this where we don't have direct sunlight is to defuse and darken 
and wash under one universal color, which I guess is going to be this color, the, oh shit, uh, stupid color mode problem, the um, environment. So I'm looking only at the shadows right now, and then go back. I'm not too comfortable with that color. And I'm only looking at the shadows, mind you. And go back and go to the initial layer, paste it on top, and then get your polygonal lasso tool and just cut out everything that is not shadow. And that way your shadows are um, unified by one uh, shadow source, let's say, which is the environment, light environment, etc. And now your light, which I don't understand, I don't understand why it's a dark, murky um, environment, but you have golden uh, highlights on the houses, unless it's like a sunset and it's breaching and it's all past a, a cast shadow, you know? So these areas here need to be either desaturated and raised up in brightness just because, you know, that's what's happening in the environment, or like hella saturated because this sunrise is orange and it's just coming in out of nowhere and it's barely above the tree tops, I mean the, 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 the house tops, and there's a, a shadow, you know, moving across them and it's catching the light right at the top. And only the tops of these houses just getting a little bit of light and maybe the shingles if they're yellow, you know, all of that stuff. So we've unified the shadows. Oh man, you don't even have a color for the roof there. Um, let me just try to invent one. Maybe it's like a a nice yellowy rooftop color. I can't. I can't even. Maybe it's red. I don't. <laughs> it's hard to. I'm just gonna keep it blue. Do you see what I'm saying here? So simplified is way better than than trying to find the color equivalent, like the equivalent per the environment of every single color in your palette. And another thing you can do is if you feel like it's all too drab. You want to add one more change in the environment behind the houses. So let's see. Go back to before I dodged, paste, and then just make it so that the base of the clouds behind the houses are a little bit bright, and there's just a little bit of a, a change in the in the weather, you know, somewhere in the distance where we can't see it yet. But when we're talking about an overcast day, I, I really don't see any way to do it where you still have bright colors. So I'm trying to create depth by splitting my opacity in half <clears throat> and erasing so that I have some houses in the distance that are well, a little bit there. And that's just a little bit of brightness change behind the houses. But this water isn't gonna do isn't gonna do much else. Isn't gonna maybe you can make it as gray as the sky around. Make sure you're keeping reflections. And that's that's it for the water. It's as bright as the as the environment allows, but you still have a frame to sit around the canvas. One thing you could do to salvage the piece is, um, is uh, just put in some early morning lights that haven't turned off yet or oil lamps or something like that. But before, um, yeah, it was a brighter day, but everything was super exposed. It looks like a stop motion, kind of without any editing. It's like raw footage stop motion uh, environment after we kind of decided on the time of day. And this is was just a bit darker. It's, a, it's it's much darker actually. But if you want to go back, you know how to. You can darken the foreground, brighten the background, still keep the cast shadow of the houses over the other houses. I love that look. Um, just because where was all this brightness coming from? That's only illuminating one side of the house. 
the light is coming from this way, but there's no cast shadows either. So the front of every house right now is illuminated. So this is the change I would make to be a little bit more pronounced, I guess, for that overcast, dreary London look. And then we have this piece, and it really needs only one big fix. See this blue color that you thought was not even important and not even worth your while? This is the color that is the color of everything right now. This is the universal color. That's the color we're using to correct the piece. Why does it do this? Look, 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 now it's behaving. <gasps> you guys see this shit? It's so stupid. Ah, oh, okay, I have to do it um, this way. Something's wrong with my Photoshop. So this is the color. Put it on color layer. Pasted it. Now I'm bringing it down. I'm also going to do it in darken layer to unify all the shadows. And bring it down. See that? Two things that we just did to unify all the colors. These are color wash and a darken wash. So things are now all leveled. So now if you go back, so let's merge. Go all the way back to the first frame. Paste. We can choose now. All right, so we have a bunch of little wisps flying around. Why would you make the inside? I'm going to lower my mic because I'm about to start screaming. Why would you make little beautiful sparkly magic lights and then blast the sunlight all the way up to, <laughs> to like <laughs> at high noon, high, high desert noon, just so those little tiny wispy lights never had a chance, okay? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Darken it so that these little guys have a little bit of life. And then why, because uh, at this point, it's, I'm just mad, why why um, make these guys have all this blue on them, you know, and not give them a glow color around them for, for the fact that they're little light sources? These rocks here weren't important. This brunch green that you had everywhere <laughs> was not important, was not more important than all of this. This is what's important. The glowy sword is what's important. The glowing pedestal after you defeated the big boss, and he's there. Here he is, the big old boss, and this is like a splash screen for a really cool game or something. Is what's important. That the, the the path up the ladder is what's important. The secondary light source, the primary light source, is what's important. This character here is what's important. So you need to go to every single step choose what your immediate light source is and illuminate every step with it until it fades so this guy going up here and then this ladder which is grabbing the the viewers arm and saying hey would you like to exit the canvas here join me exiting the canvas let's exit the canvas together hand in hand stop that the light gets weaker the higher up the ladder we go so that you can Stop asking your viewers to, to stop looking at your art. Okay? And then we've got the fact that it's not completely night outside. So the objects in the background, as the rules of depth claim, should be more faded. Look at that. Look at that. Instant whoosh. Instantly, yo, shit, I can go in the forest out here. I can sit out here. I can you know, travel this space. This, it looks deeper. The forest looks like it goes deeper. Hey, deep? Depth? <laughs> okay. Hey, wait a minute. I've heard that word before in a class a long time ago. There's a crazy lady going on and on about depth. And you don't have to lose the, the brightness of your scene. But you had cheesy, really cheesy exposure and, and really cheesy representation at the time of day. You can make it brighter. There are moments where, you know, when you see a bit more brightness in the background, that's okay. You can bring in a change in, you know, this, this atmospheric presence, this, this really mystical fog that movies today still use and all these mystical, mystical things. Sorry, it's just mystical, okay? The, the fog in a scene really provides that fantasy aesthetic. 
All right, and then we've got this primary light source purple type thing, and we've got this helmet, which isn't really a helmet, it's like a skull. So why not just darken the far side of the skull so that we can make sense of the physics here? Because really, we don't really even have a, a light source in this area. So just darken that far side. And then we can have a special light source here, special light source there. And then you've got your, your main character microscopic. I need a telescope to see him. <laughs> Hi. So at least make him large and put him over here somewhere, you know, and then and, and then we've got the splash screen um uh you know, title you know, League of Legends or something right over here. And then we've got our character with his hood and his and his walking stick. And, and then he's like looking in this direction and he's weary, weary from battle because he just defeated the final boss and, uh, and he's looking towards his goal that he just accomplished. He doesn't even need to be this big. He, he can be a lot smaller, but just so that these ladder, this ladder right here is carrying us upward. You know, he's not yet, he's not at the ladder yet. I mean the, 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 the stairway. He's not there yet. So you've shrunk in the main character so that's why I'm saying this one is a combination of light environment and um, all that other stuff. You shrunk the main character you know I'm just gonna get rid of him why not contrast all this purple with like a big golden interior light happening right here. So now you got all this beautiful purple contrasting this yellow and it's like there's a little jumba lumba something going on inside. I don't know what the fuck a jumba lumba is. <laughs> okay, so purple and yellow are not the best of friends, but they do complement each other. And then we've got the fact that they have, you know, a push on the environment around just because those la those stairs are going to catch some of that yellow on the surface. And it doesn't matter. You can change this color to anything. It could be a crystalline turquoise. It doesn't have to be anything, but just so that our, our focal point, the ladder, the, the stairs lead to something, anything, please just lead them somewhere. And that's where all these little alike colored wisps are going. And you could have made these wisps yellow in, instead. So, J. Uh, warmer. All right, so the wisps could have been yellow, golden, traveling over this purple environment. Maybe that's a little bit too much, but I like, I like it. It looks cool. It looks, um, looks like the dark crystal type of 90s aesthetic thing going on. Your choice, what you want to do. I'm cool for the analogous colors. That's how you pronounce it. That's cool too. That's magical. Pretty. <clears throat> Whatever you end up deciding should be used on the rocks nearby. So I should probably do it all in one go. Because these rocks are catching that nearby primary very, very well. Lights like to share, okay? The light likes to share itself. It likes to spread everywhere. All right, so don't forget that because that's how you unify an environment. And then don't forget the rules of depth, which are fundamentals. Absolutely necessary. So where you were before really didn't matter, it didn't make sense. There was no unified color scheme. And then, you know, if we go backward, it still, it still looks, I like the yellow a, a lot. It still looks good. The further we go, because we're at least level, this all still looks good. This all still looks good. And it's, it's you know, it's a fraction of what we had before. But this, unacceptable. Right? You have wisps flying around in this magical environment and you've made them all contesting this this really mean overexposure and you thought, oh yeah, if I keep 
chuck an exposure at the painting, it'll just look amazing. No. Environments have never been like that. Environments have way too much information for us to attempt to uh, uh, re-render it in high fidelity. Um, because it, it just doesn't work that way. We don't see that much, so we don't paint that much. Do you guys get it? The purple is, is probably the winner today. Because it's just really warm, you know? But if you wanted to make it seem like it wasn't the end or a safe zone, see how it looks like a safe zone? Because we used safe yellow. Yellow is safe. Here it still looks like the boss The boss fight is about to happen. Here it looks like the boss fight has ended. But it could, yeah, and it, it's no holds barred. You can do all kinds of shit with your game. I don't care. Okay, so a lot of stuff today about environments and the the, the moral of the story for all of these creations today is that you guys do too much work with environments. Do you guys get what I'm saying? So what do I mean when I say you guys are doing more work? When I'm critiquing these, I'm bringing them back. I'm actually taking away from the amount of work you guys put on. The fundamentals, if used right, result in less work applied. Less is more is a poetic way to to do it, but what do I mean when I say you guys do too much work? What, are, what does that mean? Too much detail? Good. So the three ways to detail are edges. You guys put edges everywhere. Contrast. Everything gets contrast. Contrast for you, contrast for you, and then small brush work everywhere. Look, 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 look. Look at this tiny brush used on the edge of a tree that doesn't even matter that's in the top right corner of nothingness in the canvas. And then contrast. Everybody gets contrast. All right, so it's about making mood. It's about creating mood, applying that mood that that really changes your illustration because it um, represents that you have prioritized the experience of the viewer over the glory of rendering. That means that you've put ahead the the the, the colors and the feelings they elicit in the viewer. <clears throat> over, uh, oh, let me just do a glory run and render every last damn thing and the viewer is going to like it whether they like it or not. No, that's not how it works. We respond to color. We respond to daytime. We respond to shadows. We respond to storytelling. We respond to organized delivery of story. We respond to story and color represents story. Um, daytime, time of day, mood, is that's all representing story. Picking colors to fit instead of adding atmosphere color is more work. Yep. And we are going to town with it with a worse result when it should just read and give a, have, a have a focal point. Exactly. Most of it can all be misted and blur and stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, the edges of the canvas, mostly. Putting in too many color changes. Good, Becky. Um, uh, the, yeah, those trees still pop way too much. Uh, imagine if we added a little bit of extra uh, rock formation. So let's have this little mommy rock and baby rock. All right, and then we had a couple of trees just chilling. Because for some reason, trees don't grow by the cameraman. The cameraman is like a walking disease. <laughs> In every illustration, the poor cameraman. Or, you know, this cameraman, he, he cuts down all the trees before he takes a picture of, of, of this environment that we drew. You guys forget about the cameraman. Because a long time ago, someone gave us crayons and we drew a tree and they gave us a sticker, which they should not have. Alright, so let's just put in the most basic bitch framing here. That works just on its own. But imagine it a little bit darker. And filter he has a chance. I <laughs> can't even read the comments right now. And we're adding a little bit of camera blur to the foreground. Just a touch. Obviously you should do a little bit more detail than this to the rock. This this is just a silhouette. This rock is a little too um boring. I might just get rid of it. Or put it with mommy rock. Yeah, whatever. Whatever you guys end up doing. I don't care. Let's do it. 
Right, look up photos. Look up photos of like a clearing in a forest. This is a clearing. There's no trees. So what does that mean, you know? And then don't forget that the yellow also falls on the rocks. I forgot to add that for this rendition. <sighs> Almost done. Then it's weekend time. And then it's and then it's taking down a porch and then it's painting and then it's construction. This the right gets no breaks. Right. That's a little too much. That's making no sense at all. Okay. So um if you learned something today in today's class and you want to give back to the community, you can join us on Patreon. Even if you just join as a watcher patron, which is just a dollar a month, it still goes a long way to supporting the longevity of the community. I've only just gotten back into critique hours again, and I hope to do this every week with you guys, every Tuesday and Thursday, as I always have um, for years now. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to keep this community going strong, uh, keep it independent, um, we just hit 100k, but it doesn't mean that my channel is going to be treated with any more respect, that I'm going to get any more notifications out. For some reason, my channel is really, really um, stunted for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe because my videos are too long and not uh, marketable. I will never join a marketing agency. I don't want them or their crappy royalty-free music. Um, so I just, I, I open this to you guys as the main you know, it's like a crowdfunded community. So if you guys want to keep it alive, you may do so here. The community challenge that I was going to announce, uh, I'm only just getting into my weekend now. Hopefully I could sit down on my laptop and just start writing up um, the next challenge. I might give you the patron challenge. I might give you a whole new book cover. <clears throat> um, if you want to submit your work for Critique Hour, go to istabrak.com and click on the uh, Reddit icon. I will start doing a bit more uh, portrait studio related classes soon for those who are curious and I will do a complete st portrait studio panel soon, a stream where me and Abu will get on the stream, I'll invite you all to come along, ask all your questions, submit all your recommended changes to portrait studio, all your concerns to us and we are entering an entirely new season of portrait studio development because the house got in the way and we finally have a safe zone now and we can live again so things are getting back to normal slowly you know such as critique hour starting up again so we will take all your rec all your suggestions control z a posable hand model reintroduced back into portrait studio more environment assets i promise it will um we'll get back into gear if you want to purchase portrait studio i've kept it on sale for the entire year now just because of the whole coronavirus me being off just as an apology to everybody, I've kept it on, on sale um, ever since then. It will not go back to $90. I've always promised a significant drop upcoming. It'll probably go back up 15 to 20% if it does go back up. Um, and that's it. Thank you everyone for joining today. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Hopefully, fingers crossed, nothing in the way. Tuesday the 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you everyone for joining. I love you guys very much and thank you for the support. Bye guys.